Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about how to set up and optimize the EDAC video feature. Your microphone will stay muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions, we will address them at the end of the presentation using the Q&A feature of WebEx. However, you're welcome to type in the questions at any time. Our presenter today is Brian Lovedahl. Brian is a sales and applications engineer for HBM and is based out of our Champaign, Illinois office. He joined HBM as part of the SOMAT acquisition in 2008. He has a background in electrical engineering and has been involved in field sales and support for over 15 years. Brian, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and today's topic is uh, adding video to the SIE data uh, collected with the EDAX system. Um, one of the things that we uh, and one of the things we've always, uh, when you're reviewing data, uh, you find something that uh, looks a little bit out of, uh, a little bit off or catches your attention, um, trying to go back and fill in the pieces as far as what happened uh, What happened here uh, as we show. Um, if you've logged uh, comments or if you've kept a journal and maybe you've uh, religiously used your you know, run descriptions with the EDAC, you might be able to piece it together. Um, but uh, if not, uh, video is a way uh, to allow us to uh, recreate or you know re review what happened, uh, you know, whether it was last week, last month, or last year. Um, you know the other thing is if it's uh, if it's your data, you might be able to piece it together. Um, if it's somebody else's data, um, you know you have may not have any idea of what was going on during that particular run. But uh, in general, uh, EDAC video is a way to correlate data, uh, analog correlate video to your analog data. Um, it's a good way to understand what was going on during that run, and it may also be able uh, to help you isolate some recurring anomalies uh, by adding visual information to your test data. Now, first of all, we're going to go over the hardware necessary uh, for collecting uh, video with the EDAC. Um, this particular setup um, uses an EDAC Lite. Um, we also support the EDAC Plus. We need firmware uh, 315 and newer, um, and also Infield 2.4 or newer uh, to view the video message channel uh, that we have added. Um, we'll also need a power over Ethernet uh, networking switch, uh, which actually uses a 48 volt DC supply. So that's a, uh, you know, for on vehicle testing, uh, you'll need, a, need an AC adapter to convert the um, DC to AC adapter to convert uh, to use the wall plug or a DC to DC converter to get the higher uh, 48 volt supply for the switch. Um, we support Axis brand cameras and video encoders. Um, the test setup that we have available and we can do demonstrations on site with um, is the uh, an Axis M M7001. Um, it's a motion JPEG encoder um, that actually sends the compressed. JPEG information to the EDAC through the existing Ethernet port. Um, nice thing about this uh, M7001 encoder is that it also supports um, a standard NTSC uh, video input. So uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, surveillance camera elements. Um, there's a wide variety of these products available um, for low light, uh, the low lux ratings. Um, they have IR illuminated um, film uh, rings, uh, say if you're going to be internal to a machine, um, or you can actually use some surveillance equipment that will take multiple camera elements uh, into a MUX and then output that onto a single NTS uh, feed, which can feed in through the M7001. So uh, again, Axis branded cameras um, are the ones that uh, we've worked with uh, because they have this uh, motion JPEG feature and allow us to use an API to set them up uh, with our TCE software. Um, if this webinar you know, gives you some ideas of how you might want to incorporate video into your testing, I do encourage you to contact your HPM sales engineer and uh, we can set up an on-site demonstration and discuss additional options that will be coming available. Um, just for reference, this uh, M7001 encoder, um, the box only is or the encoder itself only is around 280 um, US, and the IP67 camera element, which is part of the surveillance.
surveillance kit uh, to buy that with the encoder uh, is a total of 420. Again, that is a nice element, the IP67 fairly uh, rugged camera element. Um, the access cameras, as I mentioned earlier, they are integrated with the PCE firmware, uh, the, the PCE and the EDAC firmware. Uh, once we've got it properly configured, it does show up as a local resource uh, to, the, uh, to the EDAC system. Um, again, motion JPEG images are transmitted using Ethernet, so that allows us to bring the EDAC into uh, the existing COM port um, on, the, on the EDAC system. Um, the API, the Access API um, will take the information that we set up in TCE and push it out to the camera when we initialize a new test. Um, so again, uh, very specifically, um, you know, Access branded cameras at this point um, some of the models that we have tested with uh, in-house here, um, the P1343, 44, 46 out of the 1300 series. Um, I've actually got a smaller M1031, uh, which is uh, similar to um, the device in the, uh, the lower right here. And the, I guess costing-wise, the, uh, the P1343 is around $750. Um, and again, the, the M7001, um, just under 300. As far as the camera, camera setup, uh, we'll assume uh, some basic EDAC knowledge, uh, you know, TCE setup as we step through this. Uh, we'll start off using the uh, EDAC web page. Um, there is a detailed procedure on our website, this uh, access camera setup. There's a quick start guide. Um, Again, it's a very detailed procedure for setting up the access camera, but we'll simply, uh, we'll quickly walk through the, uh, the steps necessary. Pointing the IP address to, uh, pointing your laptop to the IP address of the EDAC. Again, this is assuming that your laptop and EDAC are, are already communicating, and uh, we're going to basically add this networking power over Ethernet networking switch in between. Um, I guess I would like to um, point out or suggest that you do this uh, a private network. I mean, normally, most cases that I've seen, it's uh, typically the COM cable coming out of an EDAC going right into your laptop, so that is a private network between the two of, uh, two devices. All we're doing is adding a third with this external switch. Um, adding it to your local network is going to add a lot of video traffic, uh, so would like to, again, keep it uh, as a private network or suggest keeping it as a private network. Um, if you're on vehicle, that's not really going to be a problem, but um, I mean, testing, uh, you don't want any IP address conflicts or contention with other devices uh, for bandwidth uh, with video uh, traffic. But this managed network camera option is, uh, is not available um, from the hardware tab on uh, the EDAC. You will need to upgrade your firmware. First thing to do is we'll, uh, we'll try to find a camera uh, on the network, the, uh, the top uh, box here. Um, if it works, um, great, save yourself some steps, um, wouldn't count on it. Um, if you get a brand new access camera out of the box, it will be at the factory defaults. At least we'll find it and we can configure it from there. Um, if you try to find cameras and it does not show up, uh, we'll take the serial number off of the camera, uh, enter it into this lower box, and then configure it from there, uh, which will actually step us through resetting the factory defaults and then uh, preparing the camera. This is what you'll see, uh, again, with a brand new camera. Um, it will show up as an unconfigured uh, camera under the available network cameras uh, heading. Um, this box, or this link underneath it is actually configured cameras. Um, off to the left where it says snapshot, that would normally be a thumbnail uh, from the, a live view from the camera if, uh, if it did find a camera in, its, uh, in the EDAX IP address range. So as far as configuring the camera, um, it really is key that you use this dialog from the EDAC web page uh, to set the IP address and configure the camera. Um, it actually creates username and password, and then as I mentioned earlier, TCE uh, will push the configuration to the access camera when we initialize a new test. Um, again, a lot of the camera uh, support issues that we have um, are related to networking and incompatible IP. 
IP address. Uh, so it's important that we only vary, uh, you know, again, the last three uh, digits or the, the last octet, uh, 192, 168, 100. Um, 100 is the address of the EDAC. And the camera can be, if you were to drop this menu down where it says uh, 100.1, you basically have options from .1, .2, .3, .4, and .5. Um, I actually have other equipment, so I selected an IP address. Again, careful only to adjust the last um, three digits. Um, so I've selected 192.168.100.90. They select use this IP address. and um, Basically, you have to remove power to the camera, apply the camera, apply power back, and then within two minutes of that power up event, click this use this IP address button, one of the two. What we want to see is this uh, network is properly configured at the very end. Uh, once we see that message, we will return back to the, uh, the camera manage network camera page. And um, we've, this is, uh, we'll see the camera in the selected network cameras dialog at the top. We'll see the IP address, serial number of the camera, uh, firmware version uh, for that camera element, and then also the model number and a thumbnail uh, of the camera, which you can click on, which is a view to uh, the live view of the camera. But uh, this configuration is not complete until we update the EDAC hardware list. Uh, which will go out and reset the EDAC. Uh, so we'll go ahead and step through um, to that page. If the EDAC, if you did not find the EDAC camera when you searched the network in the previous step, um, you will be prompted to uh, reset to the factory defaults prior to preparing the camera. Again, this is another sequence of removing the power, holding the reset button while you apply power back on many of the uh, power over Ethernet cameras that is the power is actually combined in the cable with the Ethernet, so it's a single cable out to the camera element. So once you've got that reset, the uh, instructions are the same uh, using the, uh, again, removing the power and applying the IP address within two minutes of applying the, uh, the power back to the camera. Again, there's a, a warnings on this page um, down along the bottom, making sure that this is a private network address, and if you're on a uh, private network, don't, there's no concern if you're using it on your local area network. Uh, you might want to make sure you have an IP address that isn't going to conflict with uh, another active element on your network. So if the uh, when we go back to the hardware tab after the EDEC uh, has finished reset, um, we'll have a success if you actually see the camera showing up in the hardware list. Again, same thing, the firmware serial number and the live view. Uh, this thumbnail uh, over in the hardware specifics uh, column um, is a good way to verify, adjust the camera position, and make sure it's uh, it's where you want it and set up how you want. Um, if you have multiple cameras, uh, we repeat this procedure for second, third, and fourth cameras. Um, we'll talk a little more about uh, multiple cameras when we uh, discuss the memory consumption later on. So at this point, uh, we are ready to switch to PCE and query the hardware. Um, as you'll notice, uh, the camera layer shows up just like any of the other hardware, bridge, HLS, uh, VIO layers. Um, once we've stepped through this configuration process, the access camera appears as a local resource to uh, the EDAC. And uh, you'll see the configuration options as we continue here. Um, one thing I would like to stress is that um, TCE 317 and newer uh, will default to the SIE file format, but older versions will require you manually change uh, to SIE. Uh, the video message channel that we created uh, is only supported in the SIE file format. The, uh, the message channel, the message camera uh, channel has been added um, for the video. So we select that. And we are presented with the channel setup that look, should look familiar to EDAC users. Um, basically, choose the message channel specifics to get into the setup options. Um, first of all, we've got the 
the size, which varies from 640 to 480 down to 160 to 120. Um, again, specifying the maximum frame resolution that we can take from any of the access cameras um, is 640 by 480. So when choosing a camera, you might want to be careful. Unless there's something, the higher megapixel cameras, the higher resolution cameras, unless there's something in the feature set um, specifications that you need, um, you can typically stay with some of the lower uh, resolution cameras. Uh, again, again, maximum resolution that we take in is 640 by 480. Uh, the other options are compression. Um, normally, our default our default is 60. And if you reference a Wikipedia article on JPEG compression, um, it will state that the human eye does not recognize the artifacts of the compression until about 50 or 60 percent. Uh, so our default of 60 is a good balance between image quality and file size. Um, frame rate, uh, that's basically a number between 1 to 30. Um, if for some reason you want to go slower than uh, one frame per second, um, we have seen people use computed time channels uh, to get that slower frame rate. Um, moving on to uh, the data modes, uh, we'll actually create a uh, message logger. Uh, we'll create one called uh, did here, and we'll, we'll select always on, which is typical uh, typical use. Um, you start recording uh, video and data at the beginning of a run. Um, one shot is actually uh, kind of a unique. I've actually seen it used uh, at the beginning. They take a single image or a single snapshot at the beginning of every run. So if you're kind of correlating your logbook uh, to your runs, and and run five says you were disking and um, there isn't a picture of a disk at the beginning of run five, then you may need to realize your logbook is off by a run or two. Um, gate actually does work. Um, we've actually created a uh, set of computed channels uh, that, that could achieve the equivalent of a burst history. Uh, we do not support burst history with the video message channel, uh, but we do have a sample uh, PCE setup. Um, that uses the gate option and a time-based shift uh, on a trigger channel. Um, you can have that sample data and the setup uh, available from our support group if you, uh, if you are interested in that, uh, that feature. So collecting some data with, uh, with the camera. Um, this topic, you know, today's topic is collecting video. Um, but due to the bandwidth concerns uh, from WebEx, we're going to go through kind of a series of screenshots for now, and then towards the end, we'll, we'll actually try and go through, um, you know, some of the playback from infield and uh, GlyphWorks. Um, this really does demonstrate much better across the table, and uh, we'll work through it today. But if you do want to uh, to see more, uh, we can definitely arrange an on-site demonstration. So collecting data, um, we left the camera at the defaults of 640 by 480, um, 30 frames per second, and 60 to 60% compression. Um, and this run uh, recorded for about 15 seconds, um, tapping load cell for about five seconds, applying loads uh, here in the middle, and then striking the load cell uh, near the 12 second mark. Um, notice that we collected 12.2 meg in about 17 seconds, which uh, leads us into memory consumption. Um, again, the default being selected here at the uh, across the left in the A column, we have our resolution 640 to 480 down to 160 to 120 by 120, and our various compression settings uh, across the top. And basically, you will see that. Uh, at 640 by 480, at 60% compression, theoretical maximum would be about would be around 3.4 gig per hour. Um, with my setup, I've actually collected um, one minute, five minutes, and then extrapolated out to 60 minutes, um, and I came up with like 2.8, a little over 2.8 gig uh, per hour uh, against the theoretical maximum of again 3.4. Again, JPEG compression varies based on um, the scene. Um, some some elements or some uh, some things will compress better than others. Um, 
down a little bit further here, you know, dropping the frame uh, size to 320 by 240 and ran the same test, uh, we see that, um, you know, extrapolating it out for one hour, we see about 900, uh, 900 meg as opposed to 2.5, uh, 2.8 gig. So it does make a big difference, uh, you know, dropping the frame rate down. Um, if you, uh, if that's enough of a video to, uh, you know, to satisfy your, uh, your testing. I guess I would also like to, to point out that we have um, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64 gig um, internal memory cards uh, available for the EDAC. Um, you can contact your sales engineer or look on the HBM web shop uh, for these memory upgrade options. I guess on the topic of multiple cameras, um, again, we have tested four cameras uh, at 640 by 480 and 30 frames per second. Um, we had a dedicated network. Uh, even with that dedicated network, we did see some drop frames. So if you definitely need the 30 frames per second, uh, you might want to you know, need to drop down the, um, you know, the resolution. Or if you want to uh, keep the 640 by 480, but you don't care, uh, you're not as concerned about uh, maintaining 30 frames per second, you could drop down uh, you know, the, the frames per second to of 10 or 15 uh, frames per second, and it's a little bit of a slideshow, but you still get the idea of what was going on at the time uh, of the analog event uh, was collected. So viewing data uh, with Enfield uh, and Glitchworks. Um, once again, this portion of the demo was better if we sit across the table, but uh, we'll, we'll step through what we collected here earlier. Um, in Enfield, um, Enfield doesn't have uh, a true you know, playback feature. So basically what we'll do is uh, multi-plot our message channel over an analog channel and uh, cursor through uh, the data to see what we've uh, collected. Um, I will suggest or let you know that uh, choosing the message channel first and then any analog channels that you want to plot uh, second, uh, you know, using the control button, uh, select the message channel first and control the select secondary channel. Um, it'll put the message channel, the video message channel on top, and then we'll keep our time reference uh, for the analog channels uh, along the bottom of our display. So at that point, we'll switch to infield. And here is the, um, some of the data that I've collected. I want to switch to at this point, here's the message channel and the load cell. And we'll do our multi-plot. And here's the uh, 15 to 17 seconds of data that we collected uh, with the uh, access camera. I'm going to select the first five seconds here where I was tapping the load cell. We'll zoom into that. And we'll actually, at first, I'm going to just click on the peaks here so you can see um, that there is video being collected. And then um, a bit of technical difficulty here. Let's see what uh, All right, not sure why I was having difficulty with the, uh, the first selection here, but we'll try that again. So as we, again, I'm just tapping the, the load cell for uh, a few seconds here, five seconds. And then each selection here, you'll see that it uh, actually switches fingers moving from one selection to another. I'm going to go ahead and try and cursor through this uh, so you can actually see. Oops. So you can actually see some of the. Uh, what you'll actually see is there's. I'm collecting the analog channel at 100 hertz and the video at 30 frames per second. So you'll see that there are three, sometimes four analog samples for every frame update. So this is the 
you know, curse using the right arrow to cursor through the data is the equivalent of a playback uh, for infield. Um, that's the tapping elements. Here's the um, load cell we collected. You'll see the, uh, the weight coming down on a load cell and then off. And actually what I've, uh, we'll go through to the, another sample here. have the uh, strike out on the end, but um, okay. So basically, we've got a, um, you know, this is not a high-speed um, video capture. Again, at 30 frames per second is the, the highest uh, sample rate that we can capture, but you will see that, uh, you know, it does track pretty closely and that delay between, um, you know, the, any delay between the analog and the video um, is basically going to be, on a dedicated network would typically be, uh, you know, hundreds of a second, possibly tenths of a second, depending on you know, if there's any uh, collision or network with an IP network. It's not a uh, you know, deterministic uh, network, but it is. Uh, very close, and you're not going to see drift uh, between the uh, analog channel and the video message channel. Um, again, this is not a particularly um, active demonstration; just a uh, you know load cell. But if you were you know to imagine um, you know a camera located uh, in the cab, looking over the operator's shoulder um, to where you can see the controls as well as a, a front-facing view. That would give you a lot of information um, about the environment, about the situation um, that uh, the, the run is experiencing while you're collecting this particular data. Um, another interesting you know, application was uh, a destructive test where they're doing energy summation where they actually had a camera trained um, on a weld joint that they were basically doing destructive testing on. So as they were increasing the pressure, uh, hydraulic pressure on it, they were actually seeing the, dip, uh, the deformation of, of the metal and then finally the failing of um, the weld joint. Okay, the, another thing that we mentioned earlier and I just wanted to show you a quick sample of um, is the, so we had a computed channel This is the, uh, I've got my data out of order somehow here, my infield. So we've got a, um, basically a video pre-trigger. Um, I have a computer channel set up that when the load cell goes above uh, 100 grams, um, I will start collecting video. And this is the time-based shift that we spoke of. So 200 or 200 samples or two seconds at, at 100 hertz um, prior to this crossing uh, 100 grams, uh, we started collecting video. Uh, you'll see that there is uh, tapping going on out here, but it's not being recorded as I as I uh, until two seconds prior to um, the event. So we've got a pre-trigger, I'm sorry, I, I, my data is somehow crossed here. Okay. Easy, 
sufficient to say we have uh, some samples that uh, we can provide that uh, you can view with Enfield or GlyphWorks. Um, we'll actually continue on here. A um, couple of things to note. This is actually from the Quick Start Guide. Um, if you select a second cursor, um, the images will uh, will not be changing in the data that long as follow cursor one. Um, talking about time stamping, this is as the video images are received at the EDAC, uh, they'll be time stamped. And you can add the, uh, the start times the metadata, from the metadata to, to actually get the real time. And uh, there are some cases where we won't get full requested frame rate. Um, some instances we also notice, like in low light situation, um, they uh, they will drop below the 30 frames, the requested 30 frames per second, um, you know, in uh, received at the EDAC. Okay. Um, another thing we can do within field is uh, we can save, we can select an image, and then uh, we can actually save as JPEG. Um, what this allows us to do is uh, create a, a series of images as they're collected in the SIE, export them out to, um, again, uh, individual JPEG images so that we can, uh, you know, use them for, if you want to use them for reporting or, or anything else. Um, the file name, when you do this export, uh, this 00007 number is actually the sequence number as they were received at the EDAC. Uh, the timestamp. Um, you'll notice uh, the 4.19 here um, is the actual EDAC time zero. It's 4.19 seconds into uh, the recording. Uh, you'll notice that the previous samples were 4.10, 13, 14, so they're all 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 seconds apart. Um, the other thing you'll notice from this is all the individual JPEG samples. Um, are either 24, or they vary from 24 to 26K per frame. Um, again, uh, there's some variation in the compression uh, of the JPEG, so as the scenes change, uh, there will be a slight size difference. Uh, this is a sample of one of the images that, uh, that we exported. And again, this is the 640 by 480 uh, at 60% compression. Um, you know, it's decent enough uh, focus here that we can actually pick out the serial number in the model, you know, the PWL50 uh, on the, uh, the, the load cell itself. Uh, switching to GlyphWorks, um, I'm using ENCODE 8. Uh, I know that uh, there's an upgrade to 9, but the functionality um, is the same between uh, the video message, uh, the media display uh, in the, the two packages. Um, the SIE with the embedded video message channel will appear um, as two files, uh, one with the time series data and another with the video. Uh, we'll need to select both. And from the available data view, uh, we can drag uh, the video file onto the media display in Infield, or I'm sorry, in uh, CliffWorks. And from here, uh, this is a screenshot. Uh, this actually I'll switch to GlyphWorks here in a minute and, and run through it at full frame rate and see uh, if it'll keep up. Um, first, we'll move quickly through uh, the load cell plot because GlyphWorks is playing back at the video speed. So switching to uh, our GlyphWorks plot, uh, this is the uh, sample that, uh, you know, just again hitting play. This was a pre-trigger, uh, so it's not going to play any video until uh, the trigger channel is done, so it will start out here at about 2.5 seconds and play through for 4 seconds. So hopefully uh, your, dis your remote display was able to keep up with that. Uh, I'll try one more time just to, s just to see. But uh, again, I hope that this uh, maybe gives you some ideas of how you can incorporate video into your your testing, and uh, we'd like to hear about how uh, some of the applications that you come up with uh, when doing this. So this uh, concludes the, the WebEx, and uh, we can open it up to questions at this time. Thanks, Brian. Everyone, we will be distributing Brian's presentation to everyone who attended uh, at the completion of the uh, 
the webinar. And we also do record every session, and I will notify you. Usually it takes about a week to get it up on our website, and I will notify you when that's available in case you have colleagues or something you want to review. Um, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Brian, please just type them into the Q&A feature in WebEx. You can reach that through the little button at the top of your uh, screen. Brian, it looks like, what about other brands of Ethernet cameras besides the Axis? Um, as we know, that we, we will need a camera that supports the motion JPEG. Um, that's actually how we bring it into uh, video data into the EDAC. So we didn't have a dedicated video layer. Um, like the GoPro cameras, for example, um, they have Ethernet capability for control, but they don't um, they don't broadcast the video data uh, over Ethernet. They they broadcast that through HDMI. So not to say that there's you know, no other cameras out there. I mean, if you uh, if, if you find cameras that uh, that su support the MPEG uh, streaming MPEG, um, then we should we would be able to uh, you know possibly review those and look into it. But uh, again, it is a uh, motion JPEG file format um, that we that we need to bring into the EDAC. Um, another concern is resolution. I know a lot of the GoPro cameras are high resolution, and um, you know we typically bring in. You need to consider that amount of data if you want to bring that into and store that with your SIE uh, analog data. Two separate people have asked if there are any plans to support high-speed video. Um, High-speed video with the current hardware, uh, the current VDAC system is um, it's really it's not really an option at this point. I think as far as the I don't know that there are any plans. I know that we have uh, you know additional hardware in the future where we're looking at uh, you know gigabit Ethernet um, between uh, camera and EDAC, you know the, the next generation of the EDAC system um, that may be an option in the future. But with the current EDAC hardware. Uh, we have not looked at uh, high speed. Um, I guess I would suggest in that point, if you're looking at you know, an external like solid state DVR, uh, we do have people that are using digital uh, outputs uh, to control the shutter, uh, start and stop recording at a time of run, but then that's not actually stored with the EDAC SIE data. It's a separate data file that has to be managed uh, independently. Question, can I use a single M7001 encoder through a USB to Ethernet adapter on my laptop, or is the network switch a necessity? Um, I guess the question would be, the M7001 encoder requires uh, power over Ethernet to be, uh, for its power. There is no separate power plug for the 7001. Um, there are such uh, things as POE injectors where you can uh, inject that power uh, through a, an ex a separate box. Um, and in that case, as long as the, if you had the IP address ranges uh, for the two adapters, um, it seems like it should work. So if he has POE power added to the camera, then that would be fine. Right. If he had a USB, and I do use a, uh, I, I have a, a USB to Ethernet adapter that I use you know, in addition to my network uh, for the EDAC, so basically extending that, uh, you know, using the onboard Ethernet and USB Ethernet for the camera, uh, as long as the IP address ranges are, are correct, it should work. All right. Is there a cable that makes video BNC to EDAC Lite CAN input connector available, or do they need to make their own? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, is there a cable that makes the video BNC to the EDAC light CAN input connector? No, there's, uh, we can't, the only way we can bring the video into the EDAC is through Ethernet. Uh, there is no option to bring um, the video in through a CAN connector, if I understood the correction correctly. All right. Um, do all of the access cameras run on 12 volt DC power? Uh, some of the M10 series uh, cameras actually have uh, a 10, or actually a 12 volt uh, DC supply. Um, we looked at that for a couple different options, but uh, majority of the cameras 
uh, are 48 volts. Uh, they use the PoE connection. Have you heard any discussions? Do you know if there's any talk of uh, supporting uh, HD resolutions on the video? Um, at this point, the um, again, the API that we use, I know maxed out at 640 by 480. Um, I would People that want the higher resolution, I would uh, definitely contact your sales engineer and uh, we'll, we'll collect those requests and feed them back to the product manager. Um, but at this point, I'm not aware I'm not aware of any plans to go with a higher resolution than that. And again, as we look at the, uh, you know, the memory consumption earlier, um, I just I know from personal experience the higher res video uh, adds up very quickly. Um, I'd all, almost like to see some external timing um, to collect the video and within timestamp without actually bringing it into the EDEC if we were going to go high resolution. All right. Is there a way to extract the video from the EDAC data file to create an external video file? Um, when we were looking at the uh, exporting the individual JPEG images, uh, that sequence number, um, that there are packages out there, animation packages, that will take a sequence, uh, take a series of JPEG images, and then assemble it into an AVI or MOV or you know, whatever video file um, you, know, you prefer. Um, but right now, that's uh, the, the in-field export is limited to the JPEG images. Um, I know that we've got uh, requests in to actually have a, uh, an export into like a motion JPEG file. Um, but right now, it, is, it would be a post-process third-party package to uh, use it, uh, assemble it using those timestamps and the, uh, the sequence number. All right. Well, everyone, that's the end of our time today. If we didn't answer your question here, we will follow up with you in the next uh, few days. We appreciate you joining us, and you'll be receiving the presentation from me soon. Thank you very much, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.